Okay, um, can we go back? I hit the forward button. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna talk about triple negative breast cancer. And, and when I was putting this talk together, I sort of felt like I was having a little bit of deja vu. Because I, I think I talked about triple negative two years ago. <laughs> and um, you'll see why it was deja vu if you, were, if you were here two years ago. Triple negative breast cancer is one of my favorites because a lot of my patients with triple negative breast cancer are very much engaged in the science and want to know what's new, what's new. And they're always asking me in clinic, what's new in triple negative? So I'm gonna tell you what we saw this year. I also like triple negative because I, um, run the genetics program, and triple negative is very strongly associated with hereditary breast cancer. So any woman who's been diagnosed with a triple negative breast cancer under age 60, regardless of family history, should be considered for genetic testing. So if that applies to anyone you know, uh, please let us help you find the resources to help to get your answers. So the problem with triple negative breast cancer and the reason these patients I think are so engaged is because triple negative means that it lacks estrogen receptors, it lacks progesterone receptors, and it lacks overexpression of the HER2 new receptors or proteins outside of the cells that make them more sensitive to growth signals, but also more sensitive to drugs like Herceptin. Um, so all we really have to treat triple negative breast cancer is chemotherapy. We don't have anti-estrogens or anti-HER2s or anti-progesterones um, because they're triple negative. The other problem with triple negative breast cancer is that um, it does have a, a, a more aggressive phenotype. And while the majority of recurrences in triple negative breast cancer will occur in the first five years compared to estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that has fewer recurrences and tends to trickle off over a longer period of time, it's this aggressiveness that makes people nervous. You can see that triple negative breast cancer accounts for only about 15% of all breast cancers. And yet, in our minds and in the work we do, it accounts for a lot more hard thinking. So in 2014, when I gave this presentation, I talked about four main things. I talked about subtyping of triple negative breast cancers, and I talked about the PAM50 score. I talked about the emerging use of platinums like carboplatinum in the treatment of triple negative breast cancers. I talked about the PARP inhibitors and the exciting new therapy that actually takes advantage of one of the molecular weaknesses in triple negative breast cancers, and I talked about emerging clinical trials. You might remember the PARP inhibitor talk where I talked about the BRCA mutated breast cancers already kind of behind the eight ball, like a four-legged table with one leg that's been removed. And the cells more, more heavily rely on the enzyme PARP to carry on cellular function and stay alive. So the PARP inhibitors knock out the backup system. And currently, we have a clinical trial going on for metastatic breast cancer that has germline mutated BRCA using these PARP inhibitors. And since this talk, PARP inhibitors have become much more widely used in ovarian cancer as well. So what's new in 2016? So for this talk, I'm going to, don't be intimidated by the number of items on this list. It will be quick, I promise. But I'm going to talk about um, uh, uh, some data that was presented on preventing triple negative breast cancer. I'm going to talk a little bit more about triple negative subtyping. I'll talk about the androgen receptor. I'll talk about markers of BRCA ness, so cells that might not have a germline BRCA mutation but act like it. And then I'll talk about the hot topic, which is the PD1 inhibitors, immunotherapy therapies, and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So in the realm of preventing breast cancer, we know that the drug tamoxifen does really well. And in the NSABP P1 trial, where women who were at risk for breast cancer were randomized to take tamoxifen or a placebo, we found that tamoxifen decreases the risk of both invasive 
and non-invasive breast cancers. But when we looked at the subtyping of the cancers that actually did occur, it turns out that in those who received placebo, draw your eyes down here, white is the placebo and black is tamoxifen. You can see for estrogen positive cancers, tamoxifen had a significant effect, but it looks like no effect for estrogen negative cancers. So we still use tamoxifen for high risk individuals because it's really all we have proven for pharmacoprevention. Um, but we understand that it doesn't really do a great job against estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. So what's happening in the prevention world outside of tamoxifen and exemestane, which we talked about at another one of these, which has similar prevention of estrogen positive cancers? Well, there are some emerging strategies that target the HER2 receptors. These strategies, of course, wouldn't affect triple negative breast cancers, but at least would try to get at those cancers that might have been predestined to be estrogen negative but HER2 positive. And so there are some trials where people who have been diagnosed with DCIS got one or two doses of the drug Herceptin. Um, there are some trials where we're using the HER2 targeting agent Lapatinib. Looks um, promising in mice and now it's becoming evaluated in women. And then we're also looking at peptide vaccines against HER2. So there's a promising arena, but that's for the prevention of HER2 positive breast cancer. For triple negative, the data that was discussed at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium was not very strong. Most of it was studies in progress or preclinical data suggests, and it's the things that you might have heard before. So retinoids, if you look down in the bottom left at that nice grocery bag full of greens and tomatoes, omega-3 fatty acids that come in fish and nuts, Metformin, which is becoming more widely known as a cancer preventative agent. Typically, it's a drug that's used for diabetes. Uh, polyphenon E, which is the active agent in green tea. And statins, which are usually prescribed for high cholesterol. The jury's still out on all of these, but I would say if you decide after tonight's talk that you want to go home and green, drink more green tea, eat more salmon, and have more green leafy vegetables, I say... Gung ho, do it. Now, moving, on, that's it on prevention. Moving on to triple negative subtyping. So, are you a lumper or are you a splitter? We used to all be lumpers. Breast cancer was breast cancer. Then we discovered estrogen positivity and negative, negativity. And then we discovered HER2 positive and negative. And now, even if you're triple negative, there are multiple subtypes and probably three to five main categories. So I like this picture because it takes a group of sort of very similar looking women. But if you actually pick out each of their pictures, they all look really different. And they behave differently. They have different likes. and that's how I think about subtyping of triple negative breast cancer. So I'm going to talk about one of the subtypes, which is the luminal AR subtyping group, circled on the left. So for this type, we find that these cancers are enriched in what's called the androgen receptor and hormonal pathways, even though they're estrogen and progesterone negative. So these are androgen enriched and actually HER2 enriched, even though they're HER2 negative. Um, so there are some drugs that are used to target androgen receptors, particularly in prostate cancer, where we know a lot more about the hormones, the androgens, and their impact on that cancer. So bicalutamide is a drug that blocks androgen receptors in prostate cancer. It's been tested against these tumors and has no benefit. But enzalutamide, which is a related drug, has shown some benefit in breast cancer, and indeed, this benefit is predicted by a test called the PREDICT AR. So the test is not yet commercially available, but it is a test that is emerging that may be similar to the Oncotype test or the Breast Cancer Index or other tests that we use right now to help guide our treatment. So PREDICT AR, stay tuned. The other drug, lapatinib, which is used in HER2-positive breast cancers, actually may have an effect on these androgen-enriched triple-negative breast cancers. 
The trick is in how you design your clinical trial. So if someone said, well, maybe some breast cancers are androgen enriched even if we don't know it, or HER2 enriched even if we don't know it, if you just take all comers for triple negatives and you apply Herceptin or lapatinib, you'll probably not see much of a treatment effect because they're just these patients with the HER2 enriched cancers are kind of buried in this big group of non responders. So you have to have many, many more patients studied over a longer period of time. So I think we're getting smarter about how trials are being designed. So these, this whole talk is a stay tuned talk, but these are really stay tuned in the next five years or so, we'll probably get some rich information that we may be able to apply. Here's the clinical data for enzalutamide, the drug that's like bicalutamide. So the PREDICT AR test for this, this kind of plot is called a waterfall plot. And you can see there's, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a solid line and a dashed line. And so just look at the number of bars that go past the dashed line. I think that's what I want to highlight here. So these are patients that by PREDICT AR um, did not seem to have androgen enriched cancers. And you can see a small proportion of them went past this dotted line, um, which is the time to progression free survival event. So the basically the duration of time that they were on the drug. While the majority of patients had only um, eight to 16 weeks on the drug before they switched off because there was evidence that their cancer was growing. Compare that to the PREDICT AR positive group where the molecular test said this is an androgen enriched group and you can see that many more patients had many more weeks on the drug compared to those who were not. So this basically shows that PREDICT AR can, can predict the response to the drug and the graph over here is the overall survival based on the PREDICT AR status. So for those who had a PREDICT AR negative um, tumor behaved much more like a true triple negative compared to those who actually had androgen sensitivity and responded to the drug and their survival was significantly improved. Moving on now, we'll talk a little bit about BRCA -ness, and we'll talk about the basal subtype of triple negative breast cancers. Basal-like triple negative breast cancer is the type of breast cancer that we see in people who inherited a germline mutation in BRCA1 and then went on to develop triple negative breast cancer. These breast cancers have DNA repair defects, and as you may know, BRCA1 is a gene that's very important in the cellular ability to repair its DNA. So when cancer cells want to create colonies and grow really quickly and spread throughout the body, they have to have a very streamlined multiplication machinery. And that involves duplicating the DNA again and again and again, pulling it into separate quadrants and separating the cells so now you have two cells. And it's this replication of the DNA that gets kind of messed up when we give chemotherapy. Many chemotherapies, like carboplatin, which is used in other disease types, um, for, for example, lung cancer, they work by getting into the cells and disrupting that DNA replication process. So carboplatin, in many studies, is starting to show some real promise in BRCA-positive cancers and also in triple-negative breast cancers. The PARP inhibitor, olaparib, is also, it appears to show effect in BRCA-positive cancer. Um, it's currently used for ovarian cancer, but it does leverage that DNA repair defect. But there's a test out there, another new test, called the HRD, that's looking for homologous repair defects. This test is a test of brackiness. This test tests the cells and says, how well can these cells repair their DNA? And based on that test, um, patients were divided to receive carboplatin or not. And then the researchers looked at whether there was actually a germline mutation in BRCA or not. And I think I have that on the next slide. 
the next slide after this. So this shows the olaparib activity. And you can see, going back to the PARP inhibitor before I talk about the homologous repair test, when you look at this PARP inhibitor, there is efficacy. So what you're looking at here is the response of the tumor to drug. And so what you want is something very close to the zero line or negative, meaning that the tumor is shrinking. The pink bars represent breast cancer that is not germline mutated for BRCA. And the blue bars represent those who have inherited BRCA mutations. You can see that the only bars below the line for this drug have inherited BRCA mutations. So while olaparib is promising for BRCA-positive breast cancer, it may not show efficacy for triple negative not associated with germline mutated BRCA. Um, and I didn't actually put in the slides about the HRD test, but the test of HRD um, Yep, I didn't put it in. The test of HRD looked at the efficacy of carboplatin. And um, what it showed was that patients who have a homologous repair defect, some of them responded and some did not. And for those of, those of the patients who did not respond, they were the ones who did not have the hereditary mutation. So when we're talking about targeting DNA replication and DNA repair, the picture still looks a lot like it relies heavily on your germline mutation status, whether you have a BRCA mutation or not. Okay, that got a little hairy in the woods. We're coming out. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, now I'm going to talk about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So if you... Um, Look at this slide here. You can see this purple bar talks about gene expression or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes low to high. So there's a spectrum there. What is a tumor infiltrating lymphocyte? So when you get your pathology report, you get the size of your breast cancer, you get the number of lymph nodes involved, you get estrogen, progesterone, HER2 status, you get the proliferation rate. Um, and so then you'll get if there's something else around. So if you have invasive breast cancer, they'll tell you if you have ductal carcinoma in situ as well. They'll, they'll talk about the precancer things that are there. But what, what this is is actually a, a look at how many white blood cells are there hanging out around the breast cancer which is really counterintuitive. I don't think many pathologists in our area are reporting on that yet. As you can imagine, it's probably a pretty subjective measure. But you know that your white blood cells are really important in fighting infection. So when there's an invader, like a bacterium in your body, or pneumonia, or an abscess, you get pus because white blood cells go there and accumulate and eat up all the bad guys and digest them and get rid of them. So maybe tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, having these white blood cells all around your breast cancer cells is a good sign. Maybe it means your immune system is revved up and it wants to get rid of this, what is now essentially foreign tissue. So I draw your attention to the big yellow circle in case you weren't already looking at it. So this looks at the prognostic value of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this is um, disease-free survival, so the likelihood of cancer being cured over time. And so there are two categories. There's high and low tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Overall, tumor infiltrating, uh, infiltrating lymphocytes don't have much predictive value. And for estrogen positive, HER2 negative, the lines completely overlap. And for the HER2 positive subset, the lines completely overlap. But if you look at the estrogen negative, HER2 negative group, you can see there's a significant difference in likelihood of cure um, or disease-free survival for those patients who had high levels of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes compared to those who had low when they were treated with 
adriamycin or doxorubicin-based uh, chemotherapy versus taxotere. So you can see that the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes actually predicted a response to treatment. And so on the subject of immune therapies, the PD-1s, um, if you haven't heard about them from your doctor or in your doctor's office, you've probably been advised to ask your doctor about it on the commercials you see during primetime news shows. Keytruda and Opdivo are the two that you hear most about. They're not the only ones. And about 10 to 15% of triple negative breast cancers fall into an immunomodulatory subsite, subset where they have tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but they're also enriched for immune processes and high, have a higher expression of PDL1. So, to put it very basically, the body has a very smart way of letting those attacking white blood cells know what's body and what's invader. And that's the PD-1, PDL-1 system. So the, your own cells are gonna express PDL-1, and the immune cells have a receptor for that, and they, when they come and they're doing surveillance, you know, um, ice knocks on the door, and they, the, tumor, the healthy cell says, we got PD-1. And they say, okay, we'll see you later. They knock on the next door. If there's no PD-1, then that immune block, that sort of block of the immune system is broken, and then the immune system can attack. So what these new drugs do is they stop that signaling from, from your healthy cells to your immune cells that says, hey, we're healthy. Now, why would it stop signaling from healthy cells to the immune cells? Because guess what? Joe Cancer is really smart and figured out how to express it. So cancer cells overexpress that to say, no, we're, we're just healthy little cells sitting here, but they're really they're cancer. And so when you use these drugs, you stop cancer's ability to evade the immune system. It also, these drugs we know now are associated with some unusual side effects, not the typical side effects you see with chemotherapy because they're immune side effects. So you can get autoimmune processes where actually your, your, in, your immune cells can, can attack your lungs as well as the cancer. So your doctor has to be very careful when deploying these. Nevertheless, there's a, new, a newer one called Tecentric or Atezolizumab. Um, pembrolizumab is another one. These drugs are in preliminary trials against breast cancer, and we're waiting for the randomized trials. So stay tuned. Those are, that's a very exciting class of drug that, uh, if you recall, Jimmy Carter's melanoma uh, was cured from his brain with one of these drugs. Um, I'm going to skip that. That's pretty complicated. But that's more about the anti-PD-1 um, and how one of the trials might look. Um, so in conclusion, triple negative breast cancer subtyping tools like the Predict AR, like the PAM-50, which I didn't talk about tonight, are nearly ready for prime time and I think are starting to be used uh, more commonly outside of a clinical trial. Um, triple negative breast cancer is very chemosensitive, and there are some newer biomarkers such as basal-like or non-basal-like, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and uh, some type of brachiness or homologous repair, germline BRCA mutation assays are emerging. And there are many promising new drugs outside of the traditional chemotherapy drugs, including, I think you'll see platinums being used more frequently, lapatinib and androgen receptor blockers, uh, and the immune modulators. So with that, I will let you write any questions you have, and thank you for your time. <laughs>